Welcome to the Amphibian Press Podcast. I am V.S. Holmes, and with me today is A.F. Stewart, fantasy author of Chronicles of the Outer Islands. So thank you so much for, for joining me, and uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and about your series. I'm Stewart. I'm from Scotia, Canada. Um, I write mostly dark, creepy fantasy and horror, although I do write with poetry. I'm just an ordinary person rather boring life other than the writing <laughs> and uh, my series is trilogy it's uh, based on Greek mythology and uh, ghost stories basically oh, cool. what I, do. I kind of merged the two of them um, uh, the, the main character is Rafe Morrow who runs the ship who basically rescues um, drowned the souls of drowned sailors and to ferry them to the afterworld, uh, much like the uh, the Greek myth of the, the boatman carrying mm -hmm. across, across the river Styx. That's where the original concept came from. And basically, he has family conflicts, very dysfunctional, and he's also got this spooky, um, mysterious menace that's trying to screw things up. I like that. When, um, when, when you're drawing from like the, the Greek myths, how much do you um, tweak? Because I know like a lot of us, when we like to play with our myths, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, liberties that we take. Um, so how, how much did you draw from and how much were you just sort of like creative liberty with? Well, with this series, I took a lot of creative liberty. Mm -hmm. I mean, I sort of basic, I did a basic thing structure, you know, you've got gods, they have powers. My, most of my gods have some sort of elemental power. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but that was, you know, basically it. I mean, I did throw a few little gods and things here, you know, to do the Greek myth. Um, you know, there's a lot of symbolism that's similar in the books. But basically, I just made up my own world building and used the Greek myth as sort of an inspiration. And mm -hmm. I also threw in a few other things like, in book two, you've got the big bad villain. He's sort of based on Cthulhu. Oh, cool. And you've got a little nod to Ray Harryhausen and the, uh, the Rocky Skeletons. I think it's Jason and the Argonauts and, mm -hmm. and that. So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of mixing. I like to mix a lot of stuff in my book. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that, that's the fun of fantasy, right? <laughs> yeah. So, was there a lot of nautical research? Because, like all of your, your your books like they have these sea themed covers and these beautiful krakens and you know you're, yeah. you're a captain um how much research did you have to do on the nautical side of things because like i'm i'm fascinated by ships yeah well i'm from nova scotia so i'm was familiar with nautical stuff going into this because we have a big seafaring history mm -hmm. but yeah i did have to do a lot of nautical research into the um, specifics like right. for instance how do you stop a ship <laughs> middle of the ocean and the answer is you don't <laughs> right. you actually have to use a sea anchor which only slows the ship down which was an interesting uh, revelation which i had to figure out how to adjust to the plot because part of the plot point was they they they're actually stopped in the middle of the ocean but so mm -hmm. i had to fix that and then I also had to research docking procedures, which um, I, I, I had a little leeway on that because the ship's kind of uh, sentient, so there's a little magic involved in there. Right. So I could play around a little bit with how they dock, but basically you need specifics. You need like a docking crew to pull you in, and you need uh, a harbor that's deep enough, otherwise you'll have to to anchor in the, the deepest part of the harbor and ferry in by the smaller boat, mm -hmm. which was, was, that actually kind of figured in, in a couple of scenes as well. And basically I had to figure out which ship they were going to be on, because, you know, there's all sorts of different types of sailing, the tall ship sailing vessels. Were they on a, a bringing mm -hmm. team or a schooner or what kind of ship? And how many masts did it have? And then I had to figure, then I had to research what the masts were called to get the names right, and what kind of sails because there's different kinds of sails that they use. Um, like for mm -hmm. most sailing, you've got the square reef sails, right, which you see. But right. if you're sailing in a storm, um, which is the open scene in the first book, you actually would use um, triangular sails. Oh, okay. They're less. Um, likely to tear in the wind, I believe, if I remember. 
Yeah, but the hardest part about the nautical research was the math. Because <laughs> I had to figure out the distance and the time that it would take for one for a boat to sail from one point to another point. So when they're going from port to port. So luckily I found an online calculator that, that if you had two points you could figure out the third. So I basically researched approximately how fast a tall ship would sail, like how many knots. I tweaked it a little because, like I said, the ship is magic, so I figured it could go a little faster, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, put a little magic in the ship and we can up the knots a few, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, and I basically figured out the speed and then mm -hmm. I figured out the speed. I made a distance between the ports, right? And then I could figure out how much time it would take. And if it took too long, then I, I adjusted the distance. So I had to make everything fit within a certain span of time, all the events. Mm -hmm. So I had to do all that calculation. That was fun. Well, and, and luckily you're you're working within a world of your yeah. own creation, so you can you can move the islands if you need to. Yes, yes, I can move the islands and make the short distances between each other and all sorts of things. <laughs> it was very helpful because you know I had no idea how to calculate this while I was creating everything. So yeah, well, and I, I I always find that like having to do those things. I mean, like it's it, it's frustrating and it's a hassle, but I think sometimes when you realize like there there's no way that the plot can work like logically the way that I've written it now, you, you kind of have to force your brain to work in a way that's like, I don't know. I, I find that I come up with some of my best plot twists when I'm trying to solve my, like the, the problem I've made for my own self. Yeah. So. Uh, and it's usually you're, you're thinking and thinking and thinking for days and then you stop thinking and then, Oh yeah, that's how to do it. That's how it works with me. Yeah, yeah. As, as soon as I like give up and close down the document and go wash the dishes, that's that's when I figure out the, the solution. Yeah, just with me too. Yeah. Whenever I'm washing the dishes, that's how that's how the math got fixed in in, in book three. Was I, I had this loose mm -hmm. plot thread about math, and I was trying to figure out why is this math important because it was supposed to be important, and I forgot about it. And then I had to go back and make it important. Mm -hmm. And I was just washing the dishes and it just came to me. It's a magic map. And it ended up shanghaiing the ship. So Oh, that's cool. That was interesting. Now, what, like, because obviously there's there's all sorts of aspects of nautical fantasy and, you know, sort of more historical fantasy. What aspects did you try and pull? Like, uh, you know, we do, we touched on the myths. But as far as the technology goes and the ships, because you, you said tall ships, so that's sort of a certain era. Um, did you stick with that or did you, you kind of play around there too? Um, basically, I stuck with that. I kind of based the history of the technology on, on sort of like um, 18th century British um, Navy. Mm -hmm. But um, there's no gunpowder except for the cannons. Like I, I forgot to put guns in the in the thing. Right. It just never occurred to me because it's all magic. Everyone was doing magic is basically how the, a lot of the fight scenes and the action scenes were. It's it's basically a conflict between gods for the most part. Right. So there was no guns. I mean, there's some sword play in it. So so I'm then I'm thinking afterwards, you know, there are no guns in this book. Why don't they have guns? They have cannon, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the ships have cannon, but um, so I, I I kind of came up with the, the explanation for that afterwards is that, that they have a, a scarcity of um, resources to make gunpowder, so they only use it for the cannons. That's why they have no guns. Oh, yeah, that's my story. I'm sticking. <laughs> it's not because I forgot. Well, and also, I mean, if if you are using magic, I feel like, especially with gods, like how how often does a god need a gun? Um, on on oh, she, on one hand, so. he doesn't need a gun. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My my main character does not need a, a, a weapon at all. I mean, he has a sword and he uses it because he's sort of like he's he's a sea captain, but he's a god, and he'd rather be a sea captain. So. Mm -hmm. oh. I like that. Now you're sort of like a, a cross genre author here. Um, so while you know we're we're focusing on 
saga of the Outer Islands. Tell me a little bit more about some of your your other work because you you like the the dark horror stuff and and so do I. So. Yeah, um, I've written some a uh, couple of horror collections. Uh, both of the ones that are currently published are sort of like the story of the villains. Mm-hmm. Like all the stories in them are from the point of view of the villains, so none of them have happy endings. <laughs> And what well, they do for the villains, because the villains win. It's like the tagline for the first one is sometimes the villains win. Oh, good. And that's basically the premise for both of those books. I do have a new horror collection coming in March um, that's 10 stories, all female protagonists. Oh, cool. And they, they're, they're, they're still dark, but some, well, I'm not sure if they end happily, but some of them end well for the protagonists, and some don't. Honestly, I like, and honestly. I like to play with the psychological <laughs> horror a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I do a lot of myth and mythology in those as well. A lot of my horror things are kind of fantasy-based as well. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you've you finished this series now the of, of three books, correct? Yeah. Um, so what's sort of next for you other than this, this small horror thing? Are you going to revisit the saga of the Outer Islands or... Yeah. Um, well, I do have a few more books planned in that world. Um, Rafe is going to get a new trilogy eventually. Ooh, um, I let, where I left the third book off, they're in this kind of new area. Mm-hmm. And so he'll be exploring that in a new trilogy. I'm not sure when I'm going to get around to writing that. And I'm currently working on getting a prequel about his mother. I can't tell you much more than that because it's kind of spoilery. <laughs> But if you've re- if anybody out there who has read books two and three knows who Ray's mother is, and the, so the creep is going to be very dark. It's kind of, I, I'm kind of calling it it's a love story, but it's not a romance because mm-hmm. it's about Ray's mother and the Nightmare Crow when the villains wrote the series. You know that story, and they'll yeah. find out how that kind of came to be in the prequel. That's and, exciting. Uh, but right now, this year, I'm working on uh, a new series. It's uh, Camelot Immortals, which is an mm-hmm. Arthurian story. It's uh, set in modern day, and it's all the people, well, not all the people, but most of the people from Camelot um, are immortal, and they're still around today, and they're still getting into trouble. And there's <laughs> there's about four books in that so far, but yeah, and I'm writing that whole series as at once, because I wrote the, the other trilogy, the saga, um, one book at a time, and it was like trying to get it all straight <laughs> with a nightmare. Right. So the whole series, the whole four book art thing at the same time now. So yeah, I'm I'm doing the same thing. Well, there, there's that, and there's also when when I first started writing my own fantasy series, like I was a different person, um, and I mean, like obviously that that person is still like in my head there somewhere, I, I assume. Um, but you know, it was sort of, I, I had different ideas about where I wanted the story to go. And even though, you know, now, now it is coming full circle and I am seeing like all the things that, that I laid down, it's much harder to, (laughs) to untangle all those things when it's, you know, you've, you've been working on it for, for like almost two decades versus like, Oh, you know, I sat down, I outlined all of it together, I wrote all of it together, it all has the same voice. Yeah, um, like with the Camelot and Worlds, I actually started this series, it was originally started as two short stories, and I'm, I'm going back mm-hmm. now and rewriting the first story, because the, that was written way back in, what, 2007, I think? So it's not quite as good mm-hmm. <laughs> as the stuff I'm writing now. So I'm, I'm rewriting <laughs> that one and, and kind of tweaking it a little, make it a little better and yeah. kind of melding it more into the series. And the same with the second story. It, that was published, I think, in 2014. So, yeah, I'm just going to be updating things a little bit so everything is nice and and then I'm going to be re-releasing both short stories before the series. So, uh, because, it, I mean, you can read the series without reading the short stories, but the short stories kind of give you a little insight into what happened to Merlin, which kind of plays into book three, so. Also, it's like, it's always fun to see a little bit more of a world that you've been really enjoying. Because I, I, I feel like a lot of times authors, when we write those, like, little side shorts. Yeah. 
they're kind of like our little pet projects. And I think in a lot of ways you can get to know an author a little bit better through those little side stories. Yeah, I want to do a little more of the little side stories for this because it's this series is written in first person. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you get to see all the stuff from the main character who's in way um, point of view, but there's all these little things that happen that we kind of don't really get to see. So I want to make a few little short flash fictions and vignettes and things and put them up for free on my website eventually. Mm -hmm. Because um, there's some, some things that yeah. happen with the other characters that you don't get to see as much that are interesting as well. So I'm going to hopefully be doing that. <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> you, you make plans and then life happens. So yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm in the middle of that one right now. <laughs> so what what was your initial inspiration? I th I think I forgot to ask. What was your initial inspiration for Chronicles of the Outer Islands, and then also for this this new Arthurian legend? Because that sounds super interesting too. Well, Saturday in the Outer Islands was originally inspired. I, um, it actually came from uh, some flash fiction I wrote for a contest. It was just an online thing, oh, okay. you know, kind of a fun contest that the author friend was doing. And I, I submitted, and basically it was writing a story about a picture. And the picture was this tall sailing ship, this great big moon. And I just came up with this little bit of flash fiction. And you can actually see the original flash fiction because I included it in the first book. Oh, cool. Yeah, so you can actually see how the story evolved from the original piece of flash fiction. It's a lot, the, the, the book is a lot different from the original because I kind of changed it up a little bit and made the main character a god and stuff. But yeah, mm -hmm. so that's originally how the book came about. And then I was writing, I thought, well, you know, I like this flash fiction, I'll just write a short story from it. So I started writing the short story, and this is going to be longer than the short story. It's going to be a book. So. And then I'm writing the book, and I'm going, okay, this is now too big for the stories too much for one book, so now it's going to be three books. And then three books turned into two trilogies and a bunch of prequels, and yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I called it my, my, my story that won't stop writing itself. So. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a good problem to have, right? <laughs> yeah. And the Camel and Mortals thing, well, I've always been an Arthurian legend freak. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love it. So, I mean, I actually wrote an unpublished uh, book uh, based on Arthurian legend. That was kind of like the first thing I ever did. Oh, cool. So, so when I wrote the original short story, which is Legendary Debts, um, that was just going to be a one-off. And then I wanted to submit a story to this anthology. And so I was like, well, why not just write a second story in that world? So I did. And then eventually I wanted to continue with it. So, yeah. But I've always loved Arthurian legends, so one, I was going to write something on that eventually anyway, so. I like that. Well, again, I, it's something that I think that we see a lot of retellings of in the historical context. Um, you know, there's like a zillion different versions of of Arthur and the Round Table, but we don't see quite as many, for, for some reason, modern day retellings as I think we do see more modern day retellings of other myths and legends. Yeah, you see a lot of modern sort of fairy tale retellings, but yeah, there's right. not a heck of a lot of Arthurian stuff. And this one, it, it's set in the modern day, but there's kind of like, it's kind of like a portal fantasy too, where they okay. go through, there's all these sort of magic netherworlds, mm -hmm. which is, is the way I, I, I figured out why um, there's not all these more immortal magic creatures on Earth. That they've, they've all kind of gone off and made their own little netherworlds. Mm -hmm. They pop in and out of these netherworlds as well. So you get a lot of um, kind of epic fantasy bits in the story too. So you do get okay. your quests and, and your Arthurian stuff that you would like you're in your more historical books. But you still get the modern day setting as well. So it's sort of like a mix of both. Is, is one of those little pockets um, the, the same world as Chronicles of the Outer Islands, by any chance? Uh, no. <laughs> that, 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 that's a whole separate world. No, I, I, um, I had considered actually making it part of another series I'm working on, which is a historical fantasy, but I can't quite know of those either. Mm -hmm. my, my worms don't really know well together. That's the only thing. So, yeah, I know a lot of people like to put all their books in the same world, but no, my, yeah. my worlds don't know as well. I have my my epic fantasy and my sci-fi. They're they're not in the same in the same world at all. But I do have 
my main characters from both series um, use the same alias. Um, that's just sort of like a little nod to each other, and that's that's it. So where can people find you and find your work? And, um, and you know, are you doing any events coming up or? Uh, well, I'm not doing anything live events. So I, have, I have a few podcasts coming out besides yours. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to be doing the uh, horroraddicts.net uh, podcast in um, a couple months. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and you can see me on Go Windy now. I'm on there all the time. Um, but you can find uh, my books and stuff on my website, which is uh, asdewer.ca. And I have a group on Facebook, a reader group, uh, AF Stewart's Minions. And I'm over on Twitter a lot at, uh, at Scrap777. So. I also have an Instagram, but I'm not there much. I know, it's, it's kind of hard. Yeah, Instagram kind of baffles me. <laughs> I like it, and but I'm not much of a picture taker. I don't take a lot of pictures. So, I mean, I don't have a lot of stuff to post. I do post some graphics and stuff. Mm -hmm. I try. Yeah, I, I always feel bad because it's like, if, if you came to my Instagram for the author person, like half of the year I'm, I'm out in the field doing, doing excavation. So you're going to get a lot of just like bugs and weird things that, that, that we find and cool archaeological stuff and, and probably not a whole lot of writing. And then in the winter, it's like totally switches. It's like dual personality Instagram. So, yeah. Well, I like the cool archaeological stuff. I mean, I like archaeology and history. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's like, I, I feel like archaeology and writing are very similar in a lot of ways because you're just sort of trying to piece together this, this story um, and hopefully get it right. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I feel like a lot of the, the soul of archaeology and writing overlaps. Yeah, well, I stick a lot of history in my writing too, because I mean, I, I'm a big history buff. So, I mean, I I stick a lot of bits of history, even when I'm writing, like creating more worlds, a lot of it's based on history and other things. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a, like a, a favorite era? I mean, obviously, you, you kind of are, are spread across the, the temporal map here. Yeah, well, um, I like British history. I've done a lot of stuff, Victorian history. Anyway, um, but um, right now I'm writing a historical fantasy that's based in the um, 15th century Venice. Oh, cool. And that is a lot, a lot of research, which is why I kind of had to put it on hold for a little bit, because I need to research that era a lot more before I keep writing it. Yeah. Because, you know, I thought I knew a lot about Renaissance Italy. Mm -hmm started and then i realized that renaissance fans has nothing whatsoever to do with renaissance italy <laughs> so that was fun now do you travel to to do your research at all or is it is it library based no um library internet um talking to people who've actually been there stuff like that yeah yeah i'm, I'm a lot of i'm very visual when i do my research too so i like pictures mm-hmm so I, uh, I do a lot of internet research on pictures and things like that. I mean, I got a basic understanding of, of historical errors, so it's a nice place to come off of for the research. Okay. Yeah, I I always want to like find an excuse to to travel for for my research, but it's like you you write about space and you write about worlds that that don't exist, so I can't. You know. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to go to space. It's but. a lot easier writing about worlds that don't exist when you're doing research. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, I didn't have the right tiles in in the hall. Well, that's the way they do it in this world, <laughs> right. you know. Yeah, the the only thing you're researching is is where you put that piece of information in your brain, and that mm. I mean, that might be harder to to find than it is to Google things, but still. Yeah, well, well, you gotta have enough of the familiar, right? When you're writing fantasy to make the fantastical work, so that's basically what researching fan uh, the the world building. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any new releases coming up or anything that you you want to let our listeners know about? Yeah, I've got uh, my horror fantasy uh, short story collection, Visions and Nightmares, is coming out on March thirteenth. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the news release, and I do have the short stories. To for the Camelot Immortals coming out sometime this year, probably around summer. I'm not quite sure when yet. So those two will be out this year. 
Awesome. The rest is kind of up in the air so far. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait, one more. I forgot. Oh, go for it. I have a, a story in a steampunk anthology, uh, Cogs, Crowns, and Carriages. That comes out on March 6th. Oh, that's Can't that. forget that one. I've, I haven't, like, tried writing in the steampunk genre yet, though I, I really enjoy it, and I do have, like, a couple ideas, but it just seems like it could, like, so much fun. Yeah, it is. The one thing I found difficult about writing steampunk is that it's changing the history, because the little, the, the, story, the history buff in my head said, that's not how it works. <laughs> It's not how it happens. It's what are you doing? And it's like, so that what that I found difficult was actually taking the historical stuff and putting the sci-fi-ish mm-hmm. bend to it with the steampunk, you know, because the fantastical weapons and the and the, the airships and stuff and this, this my logical brain is going, this isn't going to work. <laughs> it's like, which is weird because in the fantasy stuff, you know, I've done far worse. Right. It sounds like a fun exercise, and I just think, I think it'd be neat to kind of stretch those those muscles because I I think I'm a lot like you in the fact that like when I write my sci-fi, I want the spaceships to work, I want the science to work, and and in my fantasy, it's like I I want to make sure that this does make sense, even even in this world, even if there's magic, it 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 does make sense from from a logical standpoint, and um, I don't know, maybe maybe I'll find it difficult too. We'll see. Yeah, but it is fun once you get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> I've written several short stories in steampunk. And, uh, I mean, and the thing with steampunk is you don't have to do straight steampunk. You can do steampunk fantasy because I've got a horror steampunk and vampires that I'm working on as well. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you, you, you can have the steampunk aesthetic and still do the fantasy, which is fun. Yeah, I, uh, I kind of want to dabble, too, in, in solar punk. Um, I don't know if you've checked that out at all. Yeah. yeah that's that's kind of the, the, the future version of it, right? Yeah, it's it's sort of, um, it's, it's not necessarily futuristic in as far as, like, what time period, but usually it is sort of, like, post-post-apocalyptic. Yeah. But I just, I, I love the, like, solar sails and the hydroponic stuff and just the, like, more hopeful aspect of, of sci-fi because like we're, we're getting a little bogged down with with all the cyberpunk stuff yeah well well hopeful's not my bag so <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i like my my sci-fi hopeful i like my fantasy dark and doomy and broody so yeah well i've read a couple of sci-fi fly fictions they were hopeful <laughs> <laughs> i i tried i tried the hopeful thing it just always turns dark i don't know why <laughs> well i mean look outside our windows right no when i was dark even before the world got got dark too <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know it's just it's just the way my mind goes because again i like the psychological um conflict yeah. stuff it, it really interests me i think it's fun exploring too the the darker corners of the the human psyche because there's so much fascinating stuff that that people get up to and and the reasons behind it yeah and, and I, i've found i like killing off characters too so you know the, the dark fantasy and the horror suits me yeah. Well, here, here I went rambling, <laughs> but thank you so much for, for joining me today. And, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to checking out your work, especially the, the Chronicles of the Outer Islands, because that, I, I just love ships. I've always loved ships. So I'm, I'm excited about that one. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah. This has been the Amphibian Press Podcast. With me today was AF Stewart. And thank you so much for listening.